GM Seb. GM Timu. Hello <laughs> everyone. Hi. Um, it's awesome to be here. We actually met six years ago at Slash. That's right. Time flies, but Slash is the best event like for tech content in Europe and gaming. And yes. like, it's fun that we met there. Yes, it is. We just figured it out before when we were talking about what to talk about. <laughs> um, yeah, and we've actually had a kind of a common journey since, uh, since that time. Uh, some, some common touch points. So, uh, but that time when I first met you, mm -hmm. I think like you were not working exactly on what Ready Player Me was yep. today. Do you want to share a little bit that story with us? Like, yes. Your founder story? For sure. So, Ready Player Me, we've been around for nine years. Uh, we started as a hardware company building 3D scanners um, uh, to scan people and create realistic avatars. Uh, we did that for a few years, and then we built a kind of a, a software product for big gaming companies, and we worked with like Tencent, Huawei, HTC, Vodafone, Verizon, custom building avatar systems for those companies. And there was dozens of avatar systems from scratch, and that's where we really learned to build great avatars, and then eventually build it into a platform that now more than 4,000 companies are, are using in, in their games and, and virtual worlds. Wow, 4,000, <laughs> wow, that, what a growth, exciting, right? Yeah, like, we yeah. went from like 30, 30 companies using the product to like 4,000 in 18 months. So that was a, that was a wild ride. After a long time of uh, you know, building and learning and grinding, chewing glass and staring into the abyss. I'm sure we'll get back to that. Like six years of grinding before like, you figure out what would be like, the key business model for you. And yeah. so at, at what moment you found or you understood like, like working on the avatar more specifically would become like, the future of the company? Yeah, I mean, like, we, we started the company, we made a bet on people spending more and more time in virtual worlds with every year that goes by, in games and hanging out together, and VR is one component to that, and so forth. And, and that's been the core kind of bet. Um, and avatars are needed in virtual worlds. You need to have an avatar that represents you well, and you need an avatar that travels across worlds. So that was always the thing we were trying to solve or build for. Uh, but it was from hardware to you know, all the other stuff we did. And then eventually built a platform when the technology was ready and, and we were ready and we kind of figured out how to build an end-to-end -end product for developers. Uh, but it was more obvious every year that went by that avatars and virtual worlds and the metaverse is happening around us. And, and I was, you know, it's going to be important to build that. And what about Sandbox? Uh, you've, you've, had a, you ha you've had a long, long journey as well. Oh, yes. So we started Sandbox uh, with the idea in 2011 that we wanted to empower anyone to become a creator. Mm -hmm. And back then, I was already a serial entrepreneur. Uh, we had co-founded three companies with my business partner, Archer Madrid. We had two exits. And I always had a dream of how to make video games. And I saw like mobile and smartphone as a way for anyone to become a creator again, making like game cre video game development accessible. But we wanted to go one step more, removing the barrier of like having to learn programming language. And, and so using touchscreen, we came to the idea, let's make game where people can just by the touch of their finger create yeah. and share. And it rapidly grew into a large success. We, over eight years of existence of that mobile game, we had 40 million installs, 70 million creation. I actually remember in 2016, I was here at Slush pitching uh, as a founder, trying to raise funds for that sequel version yeah. of my previous game. And um, in 2018, we have been a, my mobile game studio has been acquired by Animoca Brands. And we started to play around blockchain technology. I was always exploring. I've been a geek all my life, an early adopter. I bought from the first day of pretty much every tech product. So when I found about blockchain, I said, oh, great. Let's see how we can use that in a creative way or a way that supports what we want to do. And we found that blockchain and NFT would be a great way like for uh, combining it with user-generated content to enable people to make their own content, own it, transfer it from one game to another, and even sell it outside of the place where they were originally created, those content. Yeah. That was one key challenge we had back then, because on mobile, our creators were uh, amazingly talented. We were giving them a lot of like social recognition, social fame, but we have literally no way to reward them 
financially, sharing a part of the revenue that they contributed to our game right. back to the hand of the creator. And NFT solved that problem. And so we pivoted into building a new version of Sandbox in 2017, 3D, multiplayer, multi-platform. We were one of the pioneers in blockchain gaming. I remember there were probably uh, less than 10 companies in the space and maybe even less than 10 people in the audience when we were first pitching about the ID. And uh, well, today, I think like Sandbox has been one of the most recognized uh, builder in the space for like contributing to the open metaverse. Yes. But it's not been like this overnight success story, like many people imagine. It's been like a 10 years overnight success story. Yeah. And we still have a lot of challenge and a lot of things to keep building, to grow, so that uh, we can reach that level of recognition and those hundreds of millions of users that we want to reach. Nice. And, and then what, was the, what made you make that bet so early when it was very unclear, like where three games weren't a thing, right? Like, so what made you make that bet? And then the follow-up to that is like, what did, what did it feel like when this space like, exploded into existence over the last few years? And you, know, you scaled from a relatively small team to a relatively big team now. So like, what was the whole journey like? And yeah, what, what made, yeah that, that, that's, that would be great to understand. So what really drives us is like how like we empower the creator concretely. Mm -hmm. Like I might, every day I wake up, I have this passion to see what people are making. Yeah. I'm just having all that joy that it brings to see like people being empowered and uh, giving life to their imagination with new tools and doing things that even yourself couldn't imagine. And uh, it's true that uh, like adding that capa creative capability and now seeing as well that it had a positive impact in many people's lives thanks to the ability to monetize. Yeah. That's been amazing. But it's not been like a short journey for sure. And at the beginning, we, we had, of course, a lot of like uh, challenges, people who didn't believe we were capable of building that product, building that platform. Uh, but ultimately, when I being super laser focused on creator first, mm -hmm. being like user driven, and that's some of the core value in Web3. Like, Web3 for me is user centric, community driven versus like profit centric or like trying to centralize all data. Right. And uh, that's ultimately that conviction, that passion for the space, and all the different factors of being a geek and early adopter, loving and connecting with other entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. have been driving us to where we are today. Awesome. And so in your case, like, uh, how, how did you see that growth from uh, like working with some of the major virtual worlds yeah. today? How have you been... Uh, uh, pushing to the idea that they should open themselves yeah. to connect with avatars that come from outside world and, and yeah. use Ready Player Me as a solution? Have you seen friction? How have yeah. you addressed it? Yeah, so uh, for us it was you know, custom building out the tech for big companies to start, and then when we built Ready Player Me, why we really built that built Ready Player Me was because we saw there's kind of two paths, potential paths for the future of the metaverse. And one of them is, is a good path, and one of them is not a very good path, uh, if you ask us. So one path is a more centralized path, where the metaverse ends up being owned by one company or a few companies, and we spend most of our time in their worlds. Um, and that is a scary future. Like They make all the rules, they have all the power over the world we live in, essentially. Uh, not a good future. Uh, and the other path is a more open and decentralized metaverse, uh, where you know we end up more with more something more like the internet, where you can navigate with different, between different pages and you can have a consistent experience across many virtual worlds. And it's built by millions of developers and creators, and not by one company, and it's not owned by anyone. Um, so, and for the open metaverse to really have a chance, there need to be services and standards and protocols that kind of make it easy for developers to link you know different virtual worlds together. Um, and, and that's why we built Ready Pair Me, because we felt the world is kind of getting ready for that. There's like a wave of decentralization. Like Web3 is like a set of technologies, but as importantly, it's a mindset and a philosophy, right? It's not building a walled garden, it's connecting worlds and so forth. And, and we felt that the, the, the world is ready for that, and that is the kind of macro trend com com yeah, combined with like people just spending more time in virtual worlds. 
And then um, I think we kind of timed it right. Um, and, um, and yeah, like avatars just help kind of break down some of the virtual worlds and make it easy for people to navigate between different virtual worlds. It's a naturally consistent part of your metaverse experience across now thousands of experiences. So um, yeah, and when we launched, like we had also spent six years, you know, grinding our faces off and kind of learning <laughs> what it takes to build a good avatar system. <clears throat> And so we knew what, to, what, what, what we have to build. And there's certainly friction and, and resistance from more traditional studios that still have the you know, old way of kind of building a closed economy that they control, mm -hmm. and it's a walled garden, and, and that's fine. Uh, but there's a big amount of the industry that has the kind of like the Web3 minded approach to building things, and they prefer to have avatars in their game that travel across the metaverse instead of just you know, stuck in, in their world. So, um, and by kind of working with the early market, kind of their philosophical, philosoph philosoph yeah, that's the word. <laughs> <laughs> Philosophically, <laughs> I got it. Um, aligned with open metaverse, we can build a big enough of a network to prove the rest of the world that having avatars in your game that you can buy and use across the metaverse is actually a better business model for your game. It's a better user experience because you can, you know, bring in assets from other places. So our goal really is to like show the general industry by working with the kind of like a. Uh, current network that building an interoperable system is just a better business and a better way to do things. And that really tips, up, uh, tip, tips over kind of the, the rest of the industry that is still very kind of uh, traditionally minded. Um, so it has to be a no-brainer business, business decision, basically, and that's what we're working towards. Well, I couldn't agree more. Like for me, there's only one way for the metaverse. It has to be open. Yes. Like I believe fundamentally that true digital asset, true digital asset ownership is a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. Just like we enjoy like physical property, we should be able to enjoy the way we want all our digital asset. And the metaverse is the best place for like having like all the use cases for like enjoying the digital ownership. Yes. Avatar is like the best representation of a concrete use case for it. I think the most understandable, the most accessible. And uh, we've been building the sandbox with that vision. Like you want to be able to use avatars either from like various brands that we brought in yeah. uh, to experience uh, content made in sandbox, but also of outside of Sandbox, but also like you can come and play with avatars, like ton of avatar collection from outside Sandbox. It's a feature yeah. called interoperability. It's a technical world, but at the end of the day, what it means is like just if I own any cool NFT collection that I like, then I can play around with it in the metaverse and I can use it as my new identity as I cross around many other virtual worlds. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm glad that we fully agree on that. And, and I hope that more and more people will realize that we cannot build the real metaverse if we keep like a very centralized mindset and we only agree on like we need to build APIs that are like still controlled by companies and data that are not in the hands of users behind. Yes. Um, 100%. Yeah. And like the kind of like the, the Web3 world is aligned with that vision, and that pushes us to figure out those standards and build those services that link the virtual worlds together, and then hopefully tip over the rest of the industry as well. Um, both but, yep. Yeah, no, one thing I was thinking, though, is like, even though like, uh, what we're saying is like there's this technolog technological possibility behind it's really important, we shouldn't forget as well, like, users will appreciate that benefit first and foremost because they have great content, great experiences. So the technical capabilities now today, the new challenge that we're facing is like how do we bring and build like exciting experiences, immersive experience, more social, a new format of entertainment that like is really compelling and makes users want to come and come again and again and again. So driving like retention so we can build like full business model on that and it can be become sustainable over a long term. Yes. Makes sense. And uh, both of us work with a lot of brands. So uh, how do you think kind of real world brands, like traditional brands, kind of play into the whole future of the metaverse and virtual worlds? 
So brands is typically one part of the strategy to achieve that, like to bring exciting experiences through like the content, the characters, the stories, the location that people are already familiar with. Mm -hmm. And uh, for them to interact in a more meaningful manner with their favorite characters, etc. And for the first time, because Sandbox is a very user-generated content platform, they can take those contents, uh, use them in the game maker, mix them, uh, take many of their favorite brands to create a mashup game if they want or mashup experience and monetize it the way they want as well. That's a strong first value proposition. The second thing is like brands are looking at new way to reconnect with consumer. Like they kind of exhausted of that relationship that the Web2 platform has been imposing them and uh, like not having access to their consumer uh, data, not being able to communicate or target them and offering content where like attention span is in the range of like few seconds to a minute at best and like our interaction are limited to like, share, retweet and maybe comment. Users want more interaction and they find those interactions in virtual world. Like they can chat, they can interact, they can socialize, they can express themselves with an avatar, they can carry real emotion. And on average, we're seeing users spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes in virtual world, which is like incredible in terms of time and attention if you compare to yeah. any other uh, media or format. And we want to keep pushing those creative um, uh, interaction through as well, like the way like the avatar is going to move, the animations, the emotes, the kind of action that we can do as a group in a, in a, in a land. And then once we've retained those users for the brands, um, we, those users will keep staying in the virtual world and explore all the content, content made by the creators themselves. And that's how we drive more audiences and more users so the creators can also benefit from them and fully um, maximize the potential of the creator economy where because they own the content and they receive the majority of the revenue from the value they bring, like in case of Sandbox, 95%, not 30%, yeah. not 70%, 95%, then like the creator economy will take off and all those virtual worlds should like, like become, I believe, like the next wave of the internet. Yeah, I mean, it definitely feels that ownership uh, of assets is an essential part of the future of the metaverse, right? And that really like uh, motivates a lot of creators and, and, and builders to take part and innovate and build their careers around building stuff for virtual worlds. And uh, that creativity and, and that, that energy put into the space will you know, create a lot of new uh, types of experiences. So maybe to give some concrete numbers here, mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing like thousands of people whose job is like building content in Sandbox. From the beginning of the year, we have roughly 10 builder studios around the world. We were like pioneers to create those experiences for the brand or for themselves. Today, there's more than 230 studios around the world, almost every continent. And they have like long pipeline of production to build those experience and use, like, like, employ themselves, people, and so on. So, indeed, and it's very exciting, like, that ecosystem is taking off. And like you said, like, the success of an ecosystem is essentially the success of the builders into it. So that's what we want to push forward. And nice. I, I know that you're also working on something quite exciting on your own roadmap to open this avatar economy around as well in Ready Player Me. Yes, totally. So, like, how we think about building our product is, like, it's, it's a tool, it's tool, like a tool set of, um, uh, and it kind of enables other people to build stuff. So avatars are nothing on their own. They're only useful if they're used in cool and awesome games and, and built you know, by awesome developers. So that's really our focus. And then now we're also opening up the avatar content part. So like anyone can come in and create avatar accessories and assets, work with a lot of brands because that really enables them to like, sell virtual fashion. Before, they had to go to each individual ga game and make a deal and create custom assets for them. When there's real interoperability of assets, they can just focus on what they do best, creating virtual fashion and selling it, and we make sure that it's used, used in thousands of virtual worlds. So, um, and that ability brings a lot more creators uh, into the space and opens up opportunity to take part of the virtual economy and so forth. Um, but let's uh, let's uh, let's change to founder topics. This is uh, this is a founder stage, right? <laughs> so uh, we've both had a pretty crazy few years scaling ourselves and the companies and so forth. Uh, you have a much bigger company, uh, but uh, what was the experience like? Um, you know, going through that through that crazy time, and how do you stay focused, and how do you 
how do you make sure uh, you stay sane in the whole <laughs> process? Well, uh, for sure, it's really overwhelming to see like how uh, for the past four years, Sandbox moved from being like, oh, they will never make it to yeah. kind of like, oh, they did something interesting and I'm interested to be part of that journey and build something in it. And um, the, thing, the first thing that really uh, excites me the most is like, this is global. Like every country I go and I speak, we're able to see like a whole ecosystem of builders, of projects, of brands that want to be part of the metaverse, who want to also, because it's a virtual world, it has a map, so they want to own virtual land on that map. They want to develop neighborhoods, so that strong feeling of community, proximity, because we're in a spatial environment now. We're no longer just on a website or yeah. gallery of content that are disconnected from one another. And also, like, we, even though we are building, we used to build product and tech product, today we are building uh, a platform and f we are focused on content. Like seeing all the creativity around the world and the content first, that's, that's really exciting as well for me. And I, I want to keep inspiring people that this is a platform that we do. We do it for the, we build for the community. We provide you the tools to be uh, more, to give life to your imagination. We want to take your feedback to keep improving it over time. Mm -hmm. But we want also you to fully own all the content you, you have and be the first to benefit from that creative. We don't want to take away from you like the success. We want you to be successful as we grow together. And so that's, uh, for cor of course, uh, very exciting. Also, as an entrepreneur, it's the first time that we move. I think r right now, Sandbox is about 420 employees mm -hmm. in 10 key um, uh, office locations, like Paris, London, Seoul, Tokyo, Hong Kong, uh, Los Angeles, Montreal, and Buenos Aires, and Uruguay. And um, it's a challenge, of course. Like you keep learning every day as an entrepreneur. Uh, I haven't run company large like this before, but we we learn, we progress, uh, and we all super very motivated. Like the number one thing that people see when they see Sandbox is like all our motivation and energy to make this the way we envision it. That's our dedication to the community and, and all the builder in the space. Awesome. Yeah. How about yourself? Like you moved to close to 100 people already? Yeah. No? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a challenge. I think like uh, you have to learn as a founder, you have to learn to manage the downsides when things are not going well, which I learned well over the first six years <laughs> of like two weeks of runway many times and so forth. Ooh. And that's like, that's actually kind of like easier to manage, I feel, than the, the, the times when things are going well because you have so much stuff coming at you at all times. You have to like process an amazing amount of information, and you have like a high risk of drowning <laughs> into this whole thing and like just like losing the the main thing, right? And uh, it's very hard to uh, assess that and understand if you are still, uh, you know, um, understand what's going on basically, and uh, and you're still guiding the ship, you know, and not uh, uh, distracted by everything else, uh, but. That's what we sign up for, you know. We we exactly. grab the dragon by its tail, and now we are gonna riding it, you know, trying our best. <laughs> that build you strength, resistance. You know how to run a company and like, keep like a longer runway, yeah. or being protected, specifically in the current market condition, I yes. suppose. We're like, keeping a long runway. There's a lot of companies that trust us with a very key feature of the product as well. So it's very important for us to be, to be to be trusted and and stable um, for those companies. Um, I think the last topic we can cover is kind of the, the turmoil on the market. You know, there's uh, FTX collapse with a lot of others with that. So how do you think about that, that as a founder, as a builder in the space? And how do, you, uh, how do you think about that? Yeah. So, well, the current market is like a bit d dull in at the moment. Like it's not specifically only cryptocurrencies or blockchain, it's like all tech and uh, tech companies' valuation that are being like corrected. And there's been a number of layoffs at larger company like Meta who fired 11,000 people, which is right. significant. Um, and so that, that's definitely not a great general market context 
for uh, like fundraising typically, and there might be a market risk in general, how we evolve, that you learn how to make yourself more resilient to that market risk. It's not the first time that it happens, so we understand specifically as we evolve in Web3 and crypto, like to have like secured enough cash for more than three years of development in the case of Sandbox, so we can keep developing safely. But on the other side, I'm seeing as well like a growth of adoption in Sandbox. Like we have more than 4.3 million users with a wallet. We have over 230 studios in the ecosystem, uh, 33,000 landowners. And the last season that we opened, so like 10 or 40,000 daily active users, 260,000 monthly active users. While we are not yet fully open as a platform, we're still in beta. We're not yet on mobile. So seeing that. The fundamentals, like the player adoption, the ecosystem adoption, the user adoption is there, makes me convinced that so like, if we focus on like, let's keep building, let's keep making this place more fun and fun, let's add more creative possibility and designing content, designing avatars, yeah. uh, and then when market goes back, I think like, we'll benefit as well from like, the double effect from there. Yes. I mean, I think the great companies are built on very kind of long-term macro trends, and the kind of small waves in the market don't really change that, right? Like, people are going to spend more time in virtual worlds. The world is getting more decentralized over time. And we are also out of time. Uh, so uh, I was let's short. wrap this up. This was a great <laughs> chat. Thank you, Seb. And thank you, everyone. Let's keep building. Thank you, Timu. <laughs> Let's keep building. <laughs> and see you in the metaverse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs>